I'm Charlie Reimer, and this is the Charlie Reimer Golf Show, powered by PlayGolfMyrtleBeach.com. We're back on the Charlie Reimer Golf Show, World Hall of Fame member, Nancy Lopez. And uh, Nancy, um, you're not much of a slow starter. Uh, your rookie year, you won nine events. Your second year, you won eight events. Now, I, math isn't my strong point, but that's 17 wins, I believe, <laughs> in a pretty short amount of time. Um, hey, that, that's, that, that, that's just uh, and you you won all of the accolades, not only in golf, but for, for Female Athlete of the Year, magazine covers, all, all of that. When, when you think back on that, that time period, um, what, what really stands out the most for you? Um, you know, it was just it was just the neatest time to be able to, for me as a, you know, it was an amateur player. Um, I wanted to be ranked number one in the, in the United States, and I... I, I set that as a goal, and I worked hard for that. You know, I love practicing. I love hitting a good shot. And um, when I turned professional, I felt like I was back down at the bottom of the totem pole, you know, that I had to work my way back up. You know, my goal, my rookie year was to maybe win one tournament. Mm. Um, I had no money. Um, I I uh, signed with um, IMG, Mark McCormick, and Mr. McCormick was so kind to me because I didn't want my dad to spend any more money on my career, my life, whatever. And Mr. McCormick said, well, Nancy, he says, we'll, we'll um, help you. And whenever you start making some money, you just pay us back. So I said, great deal. So I ended up finishing second in the Women's U.S. Open the, in Haz at Hazeltine the week before I went to qualifying school. I finished second behind Hollis Daisy. I might have told you the story. Um, you know, I, I finished uh, second four times, never won a women's U.S. Open, and I think this U.S. Open should have been mine mm -hmm. because I'm I'm playing golf. Um, you, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of pressure because I was really a declared professional. I'd sent in my application, so I'm going to qualifying school the next week. <clears throat> I'm playing on Sunday um, with Hollis in the final uh, match. And I went to bend down to read a putt, and my zipper on my pants opened up. And back then we had zippers that were plastic. You could zip it down and zip it back up, and it kind of repaired it. Well, every time I went down to read a putt, my zipper would start to open. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm on national TV. I mean, you know, I was young, and I was, like, oh, freaking out. Everybody was handing me safety pins and it was there was no focus on winning the U.S. Open. It's more about not showing everyone everyone my underwear. Oh my! So I ended up finishing second. I really feel like that could have been the U.S. Open. I should have won. If it wasn't for a bad yeah. zipper. Yeah, for a bad zipper. <laughs> I <laughs> so busted I a few zippers, but for a different reason. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished second in that U.S. Open, and I remember um, when I got my first check, seventy five hundred dollars, second place. Mm. And when I got that check, I carried it with me for, you know, a couple months. And I would take it out of my wallet in the mornings before I went to play. And I'm like, man, am I rich? Mm. <laughs> $7,500. I just felt like I owned the world. Mm. So I carried that check with me for a little bit. And then I finished second again later on that year. I, I, I got my card July of 77. So I started making money pretty quickly mm -hmm. and I you know it was great because I didn't have to worry about getting to the next tournament and you know paying my bills and Mr. McCormick called me and says Nancy you need to send that check because we need to pay your bills <laughs> <laughs> oh no this is my check <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. so you know it was just such an exciting time as a young person to be able to accomplish what I was accomplishing at that young age and not until January of 78 did I win my first tournament. And I ended up winning five in a row. And 
The five in a row happened where I won four in a row. I took off a week, and then I played the next week, and I won the fifth in a row, won nine that year. Was, I think, the first player to win $200,000, which was like a fortune mm. back in those days. And because of my winning, um, my my uh, daily rate went from $500 to thousands of dollars. And I remember my agent called me because I did outings every Monday uh, with IMG for $500 just so I could mm-hmm. keep playing. And I remember my agent calling me and he said, Nancy, we're, you're not going to play any more outings for $500. I'm like, why? I need to. <laughs> he goes, well, now that you've won three in a row, whatever, we're, they're going to pay, I think it was $25,000. they are going to pay you $25,000 a day. And I'm like, are they crazy? I'm just, be, <laughs> I'm just going to be playing golf and I'm going to make $25,000 mm. on a Monday? Mm. I was like, just in heaven. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I was hoping to buy my mom and dad a house one day and be able to pay them back for whatever they did. And unfortunately, I lost my mom in September of 77. So mm-hmm. she never got to see me win. Um, my dad, fortunately, was able to travel with me and go with me. And, you know, it's just it was a great time in my life, but yet a sad time my rookie year because my mom never got to see me win. Mm-hmm. Well, clearly you kept perspective because even though the money was flowing, you kept winning golf tournaments, but, but in particular, thinking about that time period, what, what was the easiest part of the game for you? What was it? Everything? Was it driving? Was it iron play? I, I, I know the putter was really hot for a long time, but, but what was the part that just, you, you, you just let it rip and didn't think about it? You know, Charlie, when I was playing really well, the fairways got wider, the greens got bigger, the holes got bigger, everything was really positive. I just felt like I could do anything on the golf course. Mm-hmm. And that was fun. I mean, when you can go out on the golf course and feel like you can just make everything happen in a positive way, it was great. And, you know, there were days that I didn't play well, but, you know, my, my bad days were like 74, not 78. Um, and that was because of the positive attitude. I, you know, I, I wasn't going to hit every shot perfect, like my dad said. And, and I wasn't going to, you know, win every tournament either. That's what my dad told me then was to, you got to get used to it. You got to be a good winner. You got to be a good loser. And so, <clears throat> you know, I just always tried to give 100%. And that's what my dad taught me. And if somebody, beat, somebody beats you, you know, it just wasn't your time. Mm. So there are a lot of things that my dad taught me that I could accept on the golf course. Uh, but it was a, it was a great time. For me on the LPGA tour, there was a lot. There was a lot of pressure, in that I felt like I was carrying the tour on my shoulders a little bit because when I was winning, the press wanted to talk to me. I had to do more outings, more uh, press conferences. When when we won back in those days, you'd go back the next year and go and as defending champion, do a press conference. So mm-hmm. I had to do nine <clears throat> that second year. So there was a lot of pressure, but I knew that tour was trying to grow and I knew that if I had to do an interview I had to do the interview it was for it wasn't for Nancy Lopez it was for my tour Mm -hmm. I knew that if I could bring attention to our tour that hopefully our purses would grow and we can make more money on the LPGA tour at that time Mm -hmm. a lot lot of characters on tour uh, in particular from that era Uh, as I was getting ready for our conversation today I was looking at your list of 48 wins I noticed Joanne Carner Runner up quite a few times to you. She got her fair share, 43 wins in her career, also a member of the World Golf Hall of Fame. I, I've admired her from afar uh, because to me, she's one of the greatest characters in golf, not just ladies golf, yeah. but in golf. And and I've never had a chance really to sit down and talk to her. We, we, is there a story that you can share maybe about Joanne Carner or just talk to us a little bit about her uh, personality because she she is very uh, very much a one and only. Yes, she is. Um, Joanne Carner was my idol as an amateur. I watched her whenever they were on television. I would watch her, and she had the attitude, Charlie, that you, you really didn't know how she was playing. You know, she was playing good or bad, and you know, she she always had such great expressions when she made putts when she missed them. She was just fun to watch. <clears throat> and when I played on the LPJ tour, she was always very kind to me. Um, you know, she lifted me up as a next generation that was going to carry the torch for the LPJ tour. Um, I played with her. She beat me. I beat her. 
It was back and forth a lot. But there was one tournament. Um, it was at Waikagil, um in New Rochelle. And on Saturday, because, you know, we had a banter, she and I did, with the press. And on Saturday, after that round, I was hoping that I'd be in the, fi- in the final group on Sunday because I'd be playing with her. But I didn't make it. I ended up in the group in front of her. And on Saturday, she told the press that she was going to leave me in the dust. <laughs> and I, and I, and I, but she said it as, you know, she knew that that would charge me up and it charged her up. And it was not to be vicious or anything. It was just more like, let's see what we can do. Uh-huh. So she said she was going to leave me in the dust. So that night I was thinking, okay, I'm going to use this as something that's going to really drive me tomorrow. She's going to leave me in the dust. She's not going to leave me in the dust. <laughs> <laughs> so on Sunday at Waikiki, which was a really good golf course, it was not easy. The par threes were long. And um, on the first hole, I birdied it. And the crowds are really rooting for her and me. And so um, I birdied the first hole, and the crowd goes crazy. And I turn around to see if she saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure she did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I knew because when she made birdies behind me, I knew it was Joanne because the crowd yeah. would go crazy. So every time I made a birdie and the crowd went crazy, I'd turn around and see if she saw it. <laughs> And who won that so day? I, so I ended up shooting 65 on Sunday, and I beat Joanne. Oh. And she was so nice. She came up to me, congratulated me, congratulated me, and she says, I guess I'm never going to tell you I'm going to leave you in the dust again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a, what a she character. Was, she was a character, and you know, I still think the world of her. Um, she plays on the Legends Tour hmm. still. And uh, I remember, too, another story. We were playing at uh, uh, the Dinah Shore back in the days when I was at the end of my career and she, you know, still was playing good, but we played together and we both made the cut and we were like rooting for each other to make the cut. And so unfortunately though, on Friday, my, you know, I had such knee issues. I could not play. I, try, I started trying to walk and hit a shot. And for some reason, my knee was killing me. And so I played two holes. And um, even though we made the, the cut, we played the, played the backside first at that time I had to quit and I was I was devastated Mm. because playing with Joanne was just fun anyway but for us to both make the cut and what was funny about Joanne and I we were both really long hitters Mm -hmm. and back when we played in that dinosaur event for my really my last time we would get up to shots and I'd grunt and you know oh right an impact and so she started doing it too. So we started trying to see who could out hit each other. <laughs> and we we're grunting. I mean, we were oh, really wow. grunting. And mm. I swear, if you grunt at the right time, you can probably hit it five to ten yards further. Oh, I'm going to go grunt, <laughs> hit some balls this afternoon, see if I can pick up a few yards. Um, Nancy, let's let's um, and and we could talk all day, but I, I'd like to finish up and spin it forward a little bit and and talk about Solheim Cup because. You, you were part of the initial Solheim Cup in 1990 uh, at, at Lake Nona, winning team. You were a captain in 2005, a winning captain. Um, I, I, I know the competitor part of you had to enjoy 1990 and being a part of kicking off what's <coughs> become an incredible match. But I, I, I get the feeling that you really enjoyed your captaincy more than than being a competitor and i know every uh, other year you go to the solheim cup and it's something that you really get fired up about and give a lot of advice about so so tell me your feelings towards that that solheim cup well you know the solheim cup uh, and thanks thanks to the solheim family for starting this event but in 1990 um it, it was overwhelming kind of because you're playing for your country um, you want to win, and you want to play great. And at that time, my captain was Kathy Whitworth. <clears throat> and um, she put me and Pat Bradley in the first group of alternate shot. And Pat and I had already won probably you know, 13, 14 tournaments apiece. And now we're teeing it up, 1990. We're nervous. We're on the first tee. I think we're playing Allison Nicholas and uh, Laura Davies. And we're standing on that first tee. I'm nervous. Um, Pat looks over at me. She goes, how are you feeling? I said, I I feel nervous. I said, how are you feeling? She goes, I feel nervous. And, you know, there's strategy involved now in Solheim. 
back then we didn't have any strategy. I don't know why we didn't figure that out. Hmm. But I looked at I looked at her and I said, I uh, she said, are you nervous? I said, yes. Are you nervous? She goes, yes. I go, you want to hit first? No, you hit first. No, you hit first. <laughs> <laughs> that was our strategy. Uh-huh. So Pat hit first, <laughs> and I was so glad because I was so nervous. So we ended up winning. Back then, the Europeans, they just didn't have strong players. They were good players, but not strong with, I think we only had eight players in that so long. I can't remember the number, but it was a small amount of players. And we <clears throat> we beat them by a lot. So then 2005 comes along, and I've watched the Solheim Cup now for years and how it grew. Um, the thousands of people that come to watch, the Europeans that come over to watch and support their country. And then being captain in 2005, <clears throat> excuse my allergies, 2005, it was an honor for me to, to be the captain. You know, winning that, that event was bigger and better than any tournament that I won to be able to be the captain of a great team for two years. Cause when you're a captain, you watch these players, you gotta, you gotta pick at the end, who's going to finish off the team. But I had Beth Daniel, I had Meg Mallon, uh, Rosie Jones, um, Paula Kramer, Nally Gulbis, uh, Michelle Redman, um, gosh, a whole bunch of great players. Mm-hmm. I, hate to, I hope I, I hate to miss anybody, but I, I have already. Um, but to watch them and to be their captain and make them a team, because as a golfer, you're all individuals. And so for two years, I brought the, these ladies together so that they could be together and really grow as a team. Because, you know, you're going to always have a feeling about a player that you may not like as much as another player. But when you're put together in the same room for two years and you go to dinners and you enjoy each other's company, you realize now you realize how much you do like that person because you never really took the time to know them because you're an individual Mm -hmm. as a professional golfer. And... Um, the story I always tell, and it was just, it was cute and funny, but I remember uh, Paula and Natalie, this was their first Solheim Cup, and I kept telling them, it's going to, you're going to be nervous. I mean, it's not just like playing in an LPGA event. I said, so, you know, you really have to think about it and get used to it. And they're like, both of them are like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get it. We know. And they didn't. So on the first day, uh, alternate shot, I put Beth Daniel and Paula Kramer together. And I kept telling them they were going to be nervous because you're on that first tee and everybody's yelling for the USA and everybody's yelling for Europe. And I said, you're going to be really nervous. <clears throat> so you have a helper with each walking with each group. And my helper that was walking with uh, Beth and Paula was Myra Blackwelder. So Donna Capone was my assistant captain. We're sitting on the first tee at Crooked Stick and it's teeny weeny tee surrounded by stands and screaming people. And I'm on the first tee, and Donna says, you know, where's Beth and Paula? I'm like, wow, I don't know. It, it's getting close to tea time. So I radio um, radio Myra, and she says, well, um, Paula's on the practice screen, and she can't move. I, she can't move? What do you mean she can't move? Well, she wants Beth to come and get her. Well, the driving range was all the way to the left, and the putting green was all the way to the right, and all these hundreds of people – and so we're waiting. And so Beth makes it to Paula. They come walking up the path where everybody's separated. And I look at Beth. And, you know, she, Beth's playing a lot of Solheim Cups. But I saw ner- nervousness in her face. She walked up. I always kind of grab my players by the arms like this. And I looked at her and said, you know what to do, Beth. Go get them. She says, yes, Captain. <laughs> so, then, so then here comes Paula. And Paula is walking like a little robot. You could see her face was pale. She was scared, nervous. She walks up. I put my arms around her, or my hands around her arms. I said, Paula, take a lot of deep breaths. About the third hole, you'll be fine. I said, and you're my birdie-making machine, so you go get them. Yes, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> so she walks up on the tee, and Colin, who is the very famous caddy, a caddy for Annika and for Sari Pock, they start arguing because they were really close. They're like brother and sister. They got nose to nose on this small tee, and Paula's arguing with them. I couldn't figure out what happened. She tries to walk away from him, and 
there's nowhere for her to go. And I walked up to Colin and I looked at him face to face. And I said, Colin, she's a woman. She's nervous. And if you need to kick, kiss her butt, you kiss it. <laughs> yes, Captain. <you> <laughs> so anyway, we start, you know, everybody's nervous. And, and I'm so glad Beth hit the first shot because I don't know if, if, if uh, Paula could have. Paula played great, by the way, too, that week. But that first start was tough for her. Mm. So Beth hits a great drive. On, um, on the first hole at Crooked Stick, there's an overhanging tree on the right. you got to hit it straight down the left side. And she had a beautiful tee shot. So Donna and I have to wait for the next group to come up, and they start walking to her shot. Well, you know, you're, I was talking about strategy. I would have thought they already figured this out. But that night in the captain's room, mm. They told us the rest of the story, and here's Beth. They're walking to her tee shot, and she looks over at Paul and says, what yardage do you not want into the into the green? I'm like, I, I couldn't figure out why that, and I already figured that out. So uh, Paul says, I don't like 79. And Beth says, okay, 79. So <laughs> they get up to her second shot. Paul has got to hit it, and the caddy gets the yardage, and the Caddy walks up to Paula and says, 78. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paula, Paula proceeds to, to skull that shot over the green. We can watch it from the tee. We're watching what's uh -huh. happening. And then uh, Beth hits it up there close. She makes a par, and they have the hole. So they go on. They ended up winning. But things like that happened, and it was great, and mm. it was fun. Uh, the pressure, I know what the pressure was like in 1990, and – you know, for unfortunately, I didn't get to play two other times. I had a chance to and uh, didn't make it. But um, it's such a great event. And when you can play for your country, there's so much pride involved. And when you can be the captain, there's even more pride involved. So it was a, a great time for me to be able to do that. And now, you know, the last three years, we, I was assistant captain to Julie Inkster. Um, we won twice, lost once. Uh, which is devastating for me. I, you know, I've, I've been captain or been a part of teams and never lost. So I didn't know what that feeling was. Mm. And I was just, <laughs> even though I didn't play, I was devastated for our players. Um, but, you know, it was great time. I think it was time for the Europeans to win. It was good for them to win. Mm -hmm. It makes it exciting because we'll be back in Toledo next year for the Solheim Cup. Uh, Pat Hurst will be the captain. Um, I would love to be a part of it again. It was just, it's just so much fun to be um, able to help these players be the great players that they were and um, that they are. And I know uh, Julie, she had the, the pod group, and I was the leader for the Corda Sisters, which was really fun, um, and Christy Kerr and uh, Lexi Thompson. So it was really fun being a part of those players, um, you know, live. Oh, and Brittany, uh, Brittany Altamari. Mm. She was awesome. Um so it was really a lot of fun, and Christy didn't make that team. Sorry, I was I was on another pod with Christy, but it was so much fun to be in these girls' lives and to watch them play. They're such great players. It's just really, really a thrill for me. Mm. Well, Nancy, we very much appreciate your time. It's been a great time for us. Uh, it it's uh, really important, I think, for everyone to to hear. Uh, from our heroes in this uh, troubled times, and uh, I'm starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, we're hoping to see you out on a golf course soon, and uh, hopefully golf courses will start filling up, and uh, we'll get this nasty virus thing behind us a as soon as possible. Absolutely, Charlie. And, you know, we just need to take care of each other and use good judgment, and we'll be back out there before you know it. All right, Nancy. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks for joining us. I'm Charlie Reimer. We'll see you next time on the Charlie Reimer Golf Show, powered by PlayGolfMyrtleBeach.com.